connection to anthroposophy, especially through his friendship with uh, the anthroposophist Kabbalah uh, researcher Ernst Gura, and with an emphasis on the vision of Judaism, mainly Muller's vision, but as we will see, uh, Bergman was very interested in this vision. In 1959, <coughs> Hugo Bergman wrote a preface to a reprint of uh, the late Muller's book, The uh, Zohar und seine Lehrer, an introduction to the Zohar, which was originally published in 1920. <coughs> Bergman himself presents the question whether the book is still relevant, considering the vast change that Kabbalistic studies have undergone ever since. Bergman's willingness to support the book, as I would like to claim, reveals two deeper subjects. The first one is Bergman's appreciation of Müller's life mission, which was to reconcile the apparent gaps between Judaism, Jewish mysticism, anthroposophy, and Christianity. The second concerns Bergman's complicated relationship with Steiner and anthroposophy. I approach this text firstly as a student of Müller, who is mostly unexplored hitherto, less several articles and small book sections. Uh, I believe that Müller's unique vision of the mentioned subjects might also help us to better understand Bergman's reception of anthroposophy. I will try to explain how Bergman's trust for Müller allowed him to overcome some of his difficulties with Steiner and to entrust Müller's version of anthroposophy, a version that gave quite a different role to Judaism than the one ascribed to it by Steiner. And that was a problem that bothered both Müller and Bergman. Bergman's relation to anthroposophy had been previously st uh, studied by Israel Cohen, Zohar Maro, and the late Israeli anthroposophist Benjamin Ben Sadok, who wrote this very nice book uh, about uh, Bergman and Steiner and connection with Judaism. Uh, the picture arising from this research can be shortly described as follows. Bergman had a keen interest in anthroposophy since he came to know Steiner and his worldview in Prague, in the intellectual salon of his mother-in-law, Bertha Fanta. <clears throat> However, a stable connection to anthroposophy was never established, since Bergman had some major difficulties with so-called spiritual uh, science of Steiner. Um, despite all these difficulties, anthroposophy leaves remarkable traces throughout all of Bergman's life, in his public lectures, articles, and many entries in his letters and diaries. This lifelong interest in anthroposophy can be clearly seen as part of Bergman's restless quest to go beyond the boundaries of contemporary philosophy and science, and his search for the relation to the human spirit and the real-life issues. And that's a quest that also led him to the realms of Jewish mysticism and Indian philosophy and the I think we're going to hear about it tomorrow from uh, Shimon and Boaz and so other things. The difficulties Bergman had with Steiner and anthroposophy can be roughly described through three aspects. The first is scientific. Bergman was truly interested in broadening the limits of science, in finding metaphysical reasons for physical phenomena and including the spirit within the scientific research. Yet, he could not accept without heavy skepticism Steiner's findings in these fields and claimed in a letter to Müller from August 1944 that it would require him to assume that Steiner was, quote, wiser than Aristotle, Galilei, Newton, and Einstein altogether, unquote. Steiner's difficult spiritual exercises and complicated esoteric terminology didn't make it any easier for him. His second difficulty concerns Steiner's conception of Judaism, and that reflects a wider controversy, which was it is widely discussed in the last 25 years, sometimes in quite high tones, concerning Steiner's alleged anti-Semitism. Steiner's core ideas set forth the rejection of Judaism, 
both as a religion and as a nation. His concept of spiritual evolution sees the ancient Hebrew nation as a preparation for the entrance of the spiritual I am into the physical realm through the incarnation of Christ in the body of Jesus from Nazareth. Steiner often scrutinized the church, but highlighted the, the role of esoteric Christianity and believed that its mission <clears throat> is only starting to reveal itself in the present. Judaism, therefore, belongs to the past and should be assimilated into the new spiritual culture Steiner foresaw. One might wonder if Judaism would have fully assimilated if modern humanity could fulfill Steiner's ideas. Bergman believed, as some modern scholars also believe, that Steiner never freed himself from common stereotypes of Jews and Judaism, and that his exegesis of Hebrew biblical texts contains two gross mistakes laying shadow on the seriousness of his methods and of his other findings. Interestingly enough, though, he never criticized as much as I found Steiner's Christology. A point to remember when discussing Bergman's reception of Muller's ideas in which the subject of Christ was widely discussed. The third difficulty Bergman had with anthroposophy is his view of anthroposophists as practicing uncritical veneration of Steiner, far from Steiner's own intention to develop free spiritual cities. However, he did not conceive Müller as a blind side and was willing to remain open to Steiner's teaching, partly because Müller, whom he trusted, was doing so. <clears throat> a short biography of Müller might help to establish the significance of the friendship between the two. He was born in 1818 in Mislitz, in Moravia, today Miroslav. Muller was three years older than Bergman and part of similar cultural and social background. As a child, he experienced positively both humanistic European culture and traditional Judaism. And as a student, chose the path of spiritual Zionism led by Martin Luther. In the first decade of the 20th century, he developed as a publicist, poet, and finally an interpreter <coughs> of Bialik and Le Gnome. His spiritual and romantic Zionist quest led to a short adventure in Palestine between 1907 and 1909, which involved teaching in the newly founded Hebrew gymnasium in Jaffa and traveling between important Jewish and Christian spiritual sites including the trip to the old Kabbalistic center in Saturn with the underground. Yet he returned to Vienna with malaria and some doubts about the fulfillment of the high ideals that possessed him. He met Rudolf Steiner at a public lecture in 1910 and rapidly became a close follower of anthroposophy. <coughs> this also brought him close with Bergman, whom he had already met by 1903 in Zionistic city and who at the time was also an active adherent of Steiner. Encouraged by, by Steiner, the two friends commenced a joint Zohar reading and translation. The war interrupted with these efforts, and afterwards it was only Müller who continued until the publication of the 1920 introduction to the Zohar, at the same year in which Bergman immigrated to Palestine. Müller, who was working until 1938 in the Jewish Community Library in Vienna, published continuously both in Kabbalistic and anthroposophical fields, though a complex tension, which I will shortly discuss, always prevailed between the two. His lifelong effort <clears throat> to conjoin the two philosophies culminated in his 1952 autobiographic article Mein Weg durch Judentum und Christentum, my way through Judaism and Christianity, to which Bergman refers in his preface. He died 1954 in London, which was his residence since the Anschluss in 1938. How did Müller's ideas help Bergman to overcome some of his difficulties with Steiner and Anthroposophy? In the preface, 
Bergman presents Murism to philosophical approach to Kabbalistic studies as a counterpart to Gershom Scholem's method. Although he praises Scholem's life mission as redeeming the field of Jewish mysticism from the status of a stepchild in Judaic studies, he still expresses criticism of Scholem's scholarship in, a letter, in the same letter to Muller from 1944. My permanent objection to Scholem is that he fully limits himself to philology and the history of literature, and that his disciples all simply revolve around the question as to whether this or that book was written by Archibald or Umer. But the question of the truth of mystical phenomena is not interesting. <clears throat> it can be regarded as a great merit if you, if you raise the question of truth in your book and refer to Steiner or even build a bridge to it. Thank God for the translation. The same thing stand is expressed is expressed in the 1959 preface, in which he now explains the main advantages of Müller's approach. Müller has his own unique perspective to the Zohar and to Kabbalah in principle. He doesn't ask for the historic and social sociological aspect. Is also little interested in differences between single layers of the Jewish secret doctrine in their historic development. He sees it as teaching of the present and struggles to permeate the Zohar as if it was a timeless book. The overall success of this initiative is thanks to his initiation to the school of Rudolf Stein. Bergman demonstrates this success through several examples starting with this Zohari concept of the different soul parts. Muller's discussion on terms such as Neshama, Ruach, and Nefesh reveals a remarkable similarity to the anthroposophical terms of soul life between earthly and spiritual realms. <clears throat> terms such as sentient soul, intellectual and feeling soul, and conscience and soul, which is connected to the spiritual self. Muller does not imply here directly to the anthroposophical terms, but shortly afterwards he does mention Steiner, referring to perhaps the most essential idea in Steiner's anthropology, das Ich, the I, the spiritual backbone of the human kingdom, which is also thoroughly discussed in the Zohar. Muller emphasizes that both Steiner and the Zohar trace the biblical origins of the spiritual eye back to the Ten Commandments, the Holy Name, and the occasion of the burning bush. Müller, to be sure, scarcely mentions Steiner in his Kabbalistic writings. When replying in his autobiography to Scholem's criticism that his writings are too anthroposophical, Müller argues that he was very careful not to mix Jewish and theosophic terminology and only did it when the similarity was too big to be overlooked. Yet, Bergman himself, unlike Schoen, saw the anthroposophical influences as a favorable quote. The present reader, asking himself whether he can somehow cope with the soul organs of the Kabbalah, will thank Nureb for getting the key in the hand. Unquote. Otherwise, minds Bergman, one could rather stay with the mechanical numerating of the solar organs without grasping what they actually stand for. Moody's hints might offer an intuitive hypothesis, says Bergman, with which one can walk further. The, advantage, the advantages of this approach in Bergman's mind can facilitate more people <coughs> who deserve a proper attention, such as the creative power of language, or the relation of micro and macro cosmos, which can help us to ascend beyond materialistic science and to understand the spiritual reasons standing behind physical phenomena. Bergman clearly advocates such a science, stating that it can lead to a revolution of science and our lives, and declaring that Muller wanted, through his studies, to pave the way for this new science. In the, in the preface, Bergman also states that Müller's worldview can help us to better understand 
the spiritual mission of Judaism. The Buddha's book dedicates a chapter to the Bund Israelis, the Israeli Union apart, describing it through his Kabbalistic exegesis as both a symbol and a real historic manifestation of a journey of a whole national community through an initiation process. An initiation process that should be seen as a model or a microcosmos for the initiation of the whole humanity. Therefore, emphasizes Muriel, a sense of ethnical superiority would be contradictory to Israel's real spiritual mission. It should rather see itself as a pioneer with a special difficult burden, which can fulfill its mission only when humanity as a whole will take an initiation path. Bergman embraces this vision, this vision wholeheartedly, supporting the idea that the Jewish nation is a microcosmos to the whole humanity. Nuri's warning of spiritual chauvinism puts Bergman exactly where he wants to be. On the one hand, fiercely rejecting nationalistic tendencies of Zionism and of messianic religion. But on the other hand, not taking the spirit out of the Jewish history on the ground of modern materialism. Müller knows, writes Bergman, that it would be a mistake to promote a rationalistic denial of deeper spiritual connections of the Jews, to give up the choice by God because of this danger of chauvinism. One doesn't give up of the heavy destiny laid before him. Müller's overall worldview, which was well known to Bergman, has much more to say about Jewish spiritual history and of present Judaism and of Zionism. He expressed it not only in his introduction to the Zohar, but worked on it throughout his whole life and brought it to a completion in his 1952 autobiographic article <coughs> in the beginning of Bergman's preface. Murray's vision takes its starting point from the anthroposophical concept of world spiritual evolution. As mentioned before, this concept sees Judaism mostly as a forerunner of Christianity, not in the sense of institutionalized religions, but as prominent spiritual impulses. For Steiner, the modern era is the time of the consciousness soul, in which a pathway to the spirit should be carved by the individual, independently from all traditions and ethnical connections and relying on a clear scientific thought that transforms itself in order to achieve supersensual spheres of reality beyond the material world. The carrier of this new stage of consciousness should be the European culture, especially the Central European, in the same way as former great cultures carried the torch for humanity in their own time, such as ancient Indians and Persians, Egyptians, Greek, etc. The real essence of Christianity can start to manifest itself only in the present age, through the inner transformation of individuals and through its cultural as impact. In the framework of this picture, as mentioned before, Steiner sought for the assimilation of the Jews into this new spiritual culture. Müller never rejected this idea but he was sure that Judaism as an entity was a vital part in this evolution, especially when considering its spiritual occult history. In his last book, Muller presented this occult history as a continuum from the earliest biblical history till the Hasidim period, and in his autobiography, as well as in a later article, he argues that this development goes on through the changes of modern Judaism and through Zionism and potentially through the state of Israel. Although he believes that Judaism should embed anthroposophical insights in order to fulfill its spiritual mission in the present. Thus, from a deeper point of view, Jewish spiritual history might be seen as truly Christian. The main outline drawn by Steiner emphasizes the fact in which Christ's descendants into a physical body 
develops into spiritual individual impulses, typical of modern European culture. Schmuller, unlike Steiner, stresses the fact that Jewish history is intermingled with this development <clears throat> and that it maintains a unique spiritual quality through its rich, inherent, esoteric components. The 20th century, argues Müller, brings Jewish des destiny and European Christian spiritual development to a dramatic peak. This argument relates to perhaps Steiner's most important prophecy, anticipating the second coming of Christ, starting from 1933, eight years after Steiner's death. Steiner did not imagine it as a physical coming, but as a spiritual event that can be experienced, would be able to be experienced by any human being as part of his or her spiritual development. Steiner also warned that in case that humanity would not be able to stand for the second coming, the result would be the rise of the apocalyptic animal and a downfall of humanity. Müller, therefore, interpreted the Nazi regime and the Holocaust as the great spiritual fall of the German culture, but also saw it as part of the Jewish spiritual development in which the Holocaust plays the role of a national crucifixion and a possible resurrection, in Müller's words. Without a real Jewish-Christian element, a positive development into the future seems unthinkable. We should least expect an artificial amalgamation of Jewish and Christian traditions. Christ doesn't have to come down again, since he stands very close to us in the sphere of life substance. He is present, but on the other hand, the gathering of Jewish people from the whole world must have something to do with this second coming. It must also have something to do with the unprecedented martyrdom of the Jews as such, in which it was possible to experience an emulation of Christ's suffering. This suffering and these sacrifices were surely not for nothing. Muller does not ignore potential obstacles to his vision, yet he finishes his autobiography with the following words. I connect myself inwardly to the pioneering efforts in and around Israel that wish to fruitfully connect the core of all Jewish spirituality with anthroposophical renewal in cognitive, artistic, <coughs> and social ways. He never criticized openly Steiner's view of Judaism, but rather tried to find in the philosophical world view any anchor that could support his vision. One may ask himself, what does Müller have in mind when speaking of an anthroposophical revival in Israel in 1952? At that time, Israeli anthroposophy was no more than a few Central European Jewish immigrants meeting to reach Steiner's lectures in small apartments. It is quite possible that he was specifically thinking of Bergman. Bergman never discusses this complexity of Muller's vision, neither enters the explosive Christian question underlying Muller's thought. Yet, as we saw, he was fully embracing Muller's vision of Judaism as it was phrased in his Kabbalistic writings. He had fully approved with the anthroposophical background of his writings. He was very familiar with Müller's autobiography, in which all the main components of his philosophy were presented, and he was also well versed in Steiner's philosophy. That doesn't mean that he was now at peace with all of Steiner's teachings, and perhaps also not with all of Müller's philosophy. Yet he never criticizes any part of Müller's thought, and as mentioned before, also never criticizes the Christological <coughs> elements in anthroposophy. Bergman's anthroposophy-related activity after Müller's death in 1954 might suggest that he took seriously Müller's mission. The possibility of helping Müller to bring forward his vision is mentioned already in Bergman's 19, 1944 letter to Müller, 
And also in Murray's greetings for Bergman's 70th birthday, in which he tells of an unsuccessful attempt to receive a position in the National Library in 1938. Yet, <clears throat> a significant revival of Bergman's philosophical activity takes place in the late 50s and the 60s. Between 1957 and 1967, Bergman had published eight different articles on Steiner in various subjects, both in public, academic, and in philosophical publications, in Hebrew, including a tribute in a book dedicated to Scholem. He also returned more often to Steiner's writings, still having the same difficulties with him, but also struggling to understand him better and reckoning him as an important philosopher and as one of humanity's greatest teachers. He would still not identify himself as an anthroposophist and probably didn't feel able to push forward the vision with which he couldn't fully conclude or thought he could not present in his own words. Yet, I think he did for the advance of anthroposophy in Israel as much as one who doesn't identify as an anthroposophist can do. <laughs> It is hard to evaluate his influence on the development of anthroposophy in Israel, since he didn't operate any anthroposophical studies or activities on a regular basis. <coughs> the 60s and the 70s were the beginning of an anthroposophical movement in Israel, growing ever since, and the approval of such a significant Israeli intellectual must have had its share. <coughs> the growth of a new Jewish anthroposophical spiritual movement, however, in the sense of Muller's vision, can still be seen as no more than temporary sparks, and was probably never formulated any better than in Müller and Bergman's writings. 